let's get started with, uh, I'm just going to run down the line and introduce all of us very quickly because I know we've got a short amount of time here. So um, Jigger to my right is an alum of the Graduate School of Journalism. And come on, let's hear it. And Jigger is, the, is currently the um, engagement lead at AJ+. Plus. Right, right, yeah. And he's also, what you tell us, the other... Your oh, well, um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan. You're not on. I'm not on. Okay. Leon. Um, <laughs> big fan of the journalism school. Um, and uh, my career actually started off as a engineer. There was, I was actually a mechanical engineer uh, from, from undergrad. I know there's a few of you guys in the room tonight. And, uh, and then I, uh, I decided that that storytelling was actually a, a whole a hell of a lot more interesting. <laughs> and uh, ended up working at the New York Times for uh, half a dozen years as a video journalist before uh, joining a venture capital firm called Matter Ventures, which was focused on supporting media entrepreneurs before, before joining Al Jazeera to create AJ+, Plus, which is a new digital channel that's focused on creating content for the global millennial. Okay, and then to uh, Jigger's right is Vicki, Vicki Haddock. She's uh, also, she actually is the editor for California Magazine, which you probably have seen floating around, and for uh, Magazine Online. She's been an editor and reporter at uh, various uh, outlets in the Bay Area, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, I believe, right, and Examiner. And now she's heading up the California Magazine, and we'll get into a little bit more uh, of that with her. And then to her right is Nikki Ozer. Nikki is the, and I'm going to get this right because I asked her. Very earlier. long title. Very long title. She's the Technology and Civil Liberties Policy Director for the ACLU of California. So, and she has her degree from Bolt. So she's the grown-up in the room, and she's going <laughs> to she's going to keep us all honest up here. Um, I'm going to defend you all in case things happen to you. Yes, that's why we need you. That's why we need you. Um, she's an expert on issues at the intersection of privacy and government surveillance and free speech. And um, she's uh, the author of a number of uh, legal and policy publications. And one that caught my eye was the Making Smart Decisions about Surveillance, a Guide for Communities. I think that's probably uh, something that we're going to want to uh, ask you about in a little bit. And then at the very end is Christina Lopez. Christina is also a grad of the J School. And she's currently an associate producer at 2020 in New York. And before that, she was with the ABC uh, team as well before uh, joining 2020. So when we get to Christina, we're going to talk a little bit about um, large market media, conventional, what we would think of as conventional and traditional media, and how they've evolved and how they're changing in, in this digital world. So first of all, audience participation, where was the last outlet, uh, whatever you, what, what's the last story you read and where was it? What was the site? Somebody, shout out, help me out here. Okay, what was it? Mashable. What was the title or what was the story about? Uh, it was CFO. Okay, something about a Google CFO. Okay, it's a business. Okay, somebody I heard say Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. Okay, what was it on Instagram that caught your eye? AJ Plus Feed. AJ Plus Feed. Okay, all right, you planted her. Okay. Anybody else? Come on, there's got to be somebody else. Something you read, something you saw, something that caught your eye. Where'd you get your news this morning? TechCrunch? TechCrunch? Okay. So. Facebook, NPR. thank you. NPR, okay, now we're rolling. Now you got the feel of it. Okay, great. ABC, anybody? ABC, okay, sorry, see, sorry. So as we can see, there's a lot of different outlets, right? And there's a lot of different reasons we would go to those outlets. Some are entertainment, some are uh, news. Sometimes these are news you can use, like you know your daily uh, morning traffic report when you're on your way in. So there's a lot of different reasons why we would um, you know, look at these different outlets. but. The one thing that they all have in common is that it's really about this, the digital has explosion has really uh, fostered this ability for just about anyone to tap into this huge system of distribution, right? So anybody can get on and post on Instagram or we can, uh, we know that, you know, TechCrunch is online and so anybody can really tap into this and, and this is really, uh, you know, led to this, this idea that now there is a, an audience hungry for this content, but there's also the content producer now, right? We are hungry for content. We've got to feed this beast that keeps rolling. And the digital medium is such that it's a, it's a fast news cycle and the space is limitless, right? I mean, Jigger, you know that you can put up a number of stories in an hour 
And whereas the other medium, like Vicky's medium, it might not be so quick. But this idea that everybody has this ability to reach this mass distribution system, and how do we, how do we vie for those clicks, right? How do I get your attention? And so how does AJ Plus compete with, with uh, you know, California? Maybe they don't, maybe they do, but it's all about views and clicks online, right? So, uh, you know, if I were to put up a title like, hey, panel's gonna speak about kittens tonight, right? And I had a cute little picture of a kitten. Somebody's gonna click that, right? That's what we call clickbait. So there's this idea that there's this, that we would put up clickbait for you to click on, right? Because we know that now with, with our analytics, analytics can tell us what our audience is actually clicking through to. And they can tell, it can tell us what you're interested in and what we should really not be paying attention to. So as we think about that, I wanna ask Vicki, especially for California Online, because they are relatively new, and I know they have, um, I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but 1.5 million uh, views. And so talk to us a little bit about how this idea of, of trying to catch eyes and clickbait might affect an editorial decision or might just affect your assignment uh, decisions. So I started in journalism when we just presumed that we exercised our news judgment and we gave people news. And part of our job was figuring out what was important for people to know. And we really didn't know if they read it or not. We presumed that they did because we're optimists and we thought of course they would want to read our stuff. Um, that's obviously part of what's happened with analytics and with so much online is that we now have the ability to see exactly what people are reading and what people are not reading, which I think is good and bad. I mean, I think it's really great that we get feedback about what people are reading. Um, but I also think as a journalist that there is a potential downside in that there's a difference between quality and quantity. And uh, I know, and I should clarify by the way that the, the wonderful Pat Joseph under the direction of Wendy Miller actually does the print magazine part of California and I do the online part, it's a newer part. How many of you have heard of California Online, Cal alums? Okay, so that's good, <laughs> that's a good sign. Um, we are, uh, our goal is to take the General Interest California Magazine, which is a, I think a fabulous award-winning magazine, I can say that because I don't directly have a hand in that, um, and to elevate that quality content into an online product we are still new at it, and we have great visions for how to step it up, but it's, it's a work in progress, and so hopefully in the next year you'll be seeing more changes that bring us more into the digital age. Um, but I, I feel like I know as an editor what, I, what the kinds of stories that I could put up that would get a lot of clicks. And that's not always what I wanna do, because I wanna put up stories that I think are important, and stories that I, that I think people need to know about, and then I want to figure out how to get people to read those stories, right? So it's not like the audience is not important, um, but it's trying to figure out how to tell important stories in a way that is going to be so compelling that people are going to want to, to follow them. To give you an example from just the, the last couple of weeks, we had a story that some of you may have seen this past week um, that is one of those stories that we just knew was going to be a very clickable story. It actually involved a Cal alum, in, uh, who's a, well, no, not alum, a Haas business student who's about to get his MBA. Um, and he and his team have an invention in progress they're about to launch uh, to create a smart vibrator. Um, this is to, forget smart watches and smartphones, this takes it to an entirely different level. And, and the innovator's name is John Wang. So <laughs> I, wanted, I want to let you know that the reporter exercising great restraint made no particular point about this in the story. But suffice it to say, that story, which is a really fun story, actually, and that story did really well. We also did a couple of stories in the last week, a couple of weeks. One on the drive toward restorative justice. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. Entirely, you, I'm sure you are. Entirely new approach to juvenile justice, particularly, but, to, but also for adult criminal justice that, that would try to deal with crime instead of simply punishing people and sending them off to prison, um, trying to find a way to have the victim be made more whole in a way and have the, the perpetrator actually confront the consequences of what they've done, having them sit down together and work out a system of restitution, um, a way to make it right. Um, and that's, I think, a really important social, 
story. And so I'm proud to say that we managed to get about as much, um, as many people reading that story as we did the vibrator story. <laughs> but I will also tell you, that took a lot more work in terms of promotion, in terms of trying to work every different you know, social media outlet, trying to get the word out and spread. Um, Marketing-wise, that took a lot more effort. So I think that the challenge that we face, particularly as a very small operation, um, is to try to find ways to get the audience for our stories that we do, that we can still feel good about, you know, that we don't feel like we've sacrificed our journalistic integrity to do clickbait, um, but yet we would love those great Google Analytic numbers. And so I guess the bottom line here then for us is trying to find a way, rather than simply having a print product go online, to try to, to increasingly figure out how to use all of the tools that are available to really make a story vivid and make a story come to life in a different and more interactive way on the web. And I think that's our, that's our challenge. And I think in, in facing that challenge, um, there's, you know, I think every outlet probably faces that challenge in one way or another. And so I think it's interesting when we jump over to thinking about AJ Plus and um, Jigger, you guys went after a very specific demographic. You have a deliberate uh, way of telling your stories and it's um, you know, it's really crafted in a particular way. So talk to us a little bit about how, how that came about and how does it affect what goes on in, in the editorial process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I think it's incredibly important. Uh, just by a show of hands, how, how many of you have interacted with a piece of AJ Plus content so far, whether it's on the app or on Facebook? Great, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a way that it's actually starting to um, actually be spread more more organically. And when we talk about actually uh, clickability, right, like it's actually really easy to get someone to click on something. But what we measure ourselves by is how much is our audience actually sharing something? Because the value of the share, the value of, of actually taking a piece of content, doesn't matter what that piece of content is, and actually saying, actually, I, wanna, I want my network, doesn't matter if it's a network on WhatsApp, like three people, or on my Twitter feed publicly, I want them to know about this thing um, that's incredibly powerful and valuable. And that's what we think about when we think about our editorial, right? When we have our editorial meetings, we really are trying to think about what is it about this piece of, of the story that's really going to resonate and get people to actually share it. Because it is really about getting a conversation going, right? And so we know if we can get people to share it, they will actually jump, also jump into a conversation space. And that's interesting for us because we are focused, you know, to begin with on the U.S. millennial that's globally minded and then branching out globally into the global millennials and collect, connecting them all together um, in a conversation space about the stories that really do matter to them. So we think about that in our editorial process. So as we go from that editorial process, we think about that editorial process and we think about you've sort of moved it from just clicking to we want our audience to engage, to share with their own network, to move it forward. Let's back up a little bit and talk about how we actually can produce those stories and produce enough content and gather so much information. I mean, there's so many tools out there, and I want to bring Nicole into this because I think this is where all of us producers are beginning to, to realize that the, the access to information is, is becoming limitless, but without, uh, with cost, right? whatever that cost may be. I'm not talking monetary. And I can, you know, a few years ago, uh, you know, license plate readers, nobody really knew that you could be driving down the road and your license plate could be being read by companies. And, you know, there were people putting up weather balloons to count crowds at Occupy protests. And, and now we have a lot of news about drones. And, and a lot of, uh, I know, agencies, especially news agencies, they're concerned. Like, can we use the drone for this? Can we use it for that? So. And I know these are all discussions that we, we hear about, we read about, and they are ongoing, but Nicole, I want to bring you into this now and, and talk to us a little bit about maybe what's, what's kind of washing up on your desk now. What's, what's up and coming? What sorts of things are you guys chasing down that may begin to affect, affect the way we can produce content? You know, well, digital platforms are an amazing opportunity to reach new audiences, to reach people who might not have access to um, 
you know, print publications who may live in different places. Obviously, Cal alumni is looking to do that as well to be able to reach broader audiences. Um, my work at the ACLU is really to make sure that as technology advances, that we try and find ways to safeguard fundamental rights to privacy and free speech. So it's not about stifling technology, it's about finding the ways that we can have the benefits of new technology, maximize those benefits, while also being mindful of privacy rights, free speech rights. I think there's two ways that these issues really come uh, alive in my work most recently. One has been, um, obviously we're increasingly, a lot of people raise their hands saying that their, um, their content was coming from Facebook or from Twitter. Many of us are using private platforms, whether we're traditional journalists or regular individuals, we're using private platforms to connect and communicate about important issues. Um, as this speech has moved from the public square and the traditional media to private platforms, a lot of these companies have created rules that they themselves enforce um, about what kind of content is able to be up, what kind of content needs to come down. And a lot of those rules change over time. They may be very discretionary. They may change depending on the vagaries of the political or social situation. And I think that has a real implication on political content, social content, um, and our ability to connect on really complex and complicated issues. Um, a couple of recent examples, uh, one, one that, that touched the ACLU but wasn't sort of as, uh, as politically motivated, um, another being very political, um, the ACLU actually posted a blog post about a statue that was at the center of an obscenity debate in Kansas. It was a bronze statue. We posted a blog post on Facebook about this statue that was at the middle of this obscenity debate. And Facebook actually improperly flagged the picture of a statue as a nude woman and locked, locked the ACLU out of our Facebook account for an entire weekend. <laughs> I got this, this call from ACLU National saying, oh my gosh, what do we do? There's no appeals process. Luckily, I know the head of global content policy for Facebook. I was recently <laughs> on the panel with her at 1230 today. And I called up and I said, uh, you just locked us out of our Facebook account. Uh, you mistaked a statue that's actually at the center of an obscenity debate. Ironically, you uh, censored our content. She's like, many expletives. Oh my god, we totally effed up. Um, but that's an example of if you're not the ACLU, if you don't happen to know the head of global content policy for Facebook, you might be SOL. Um, and those are issues that can have really serious ramifications for people who are engaging in political content, social connection, a whole range of issues, mobilizing protests. We all know sort of how important the internet has become. Um, very recently, obviously, there's been a lot of conversation about um, ISIS and videos and whether things should be up or down on things like Twitter and YouTube. So these are really complex issues that are happening right now, but it is because we've moved to a digital medium where private platforms are now often the arbiters of this speech. So I think that's one issue that's obviously very high up on our agenda that we're working on. The second is, um, and you mentioned a little bit kind of how social networking and ability to put on digital content ends up cr creating a conversation with people. And a lot of times, um, you know, people think they're having a conversation with the content, but they're also having a conversation with the platform because the platform is collecting data on who they are and where they are and what they've said and what they've searched for. And sometimes that can be very sensitive data on things that they're exploring do their political lives, their social lives. And so that privacy angle of what kind of data is being collected as we move from uh, reading a physical newspaper to reading something in a digital medium, and where does that data go? Is it sold by the company? Is it shared with others? Does the government reach in and subpoena that information without a warrant we've represented? a series of journalists and, and other platforms who've had data subpoenaed and requested about their users and what they've searched for. Um, and we're currently working to update um, electronic privacy laws to safeguard that data much more holistically. So 
those are two major issues that are huge um, that really implicate are we going to be able to be on a digital platform and using digital media while still safeguarding fundamental privacy and free speech. So those are two things on my to-do list. So When you get back, right? When I, yes, on yeah. Monday night. Um, so Christina, I would say of, of all of us is probably, you know, she sort of stands, represents right now the, what we would consider traditional, conventional, big media, you know, ABC 2020. They've been on how many seasons? 36. 36 seasons. So what, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but maybe give us a, give it a shot. What's been, what do you think has been the biggest, maybe most significant change in those 36 years? Or was it small incremental changes? Or how have they managed to sort of weather the storm, so to speak? Sure. Uh, throughout our time, I think the way we've evolved is we've always been relevant to the viewer. We've always kept the viewer in mind. Kind of like, what stories would you want to watch on a Friday night at 10 o'clock? And we always try to be mindful of the way we're telling these stories, uh, not just giving you kind of stories you've heard all week and kind of repackaging them, but actually taking you on a shared experience, telling you a story where you actually come along with us as we're going out to report it. So that means putting a GoPro inside the car and we're driving along with a police, police reporter and instead of seeing their dash cam footage, you're seeing ours. Or we're actually going up to someone's house to confront them about a story we've been trying to get their views on and they've been evading us. So it's really about a shared experience, not so much telling you stories through a medium that you've always grown up watching. And you know, 2020 is a veteran uh, broadcast. I grew up watching it as a young girl. And to be able to work um, with 2020 now and kind of see how the sausage is made, so to speak, it's very different. And um, we try to kind of tell stories in a way that's experimental. You know, we're constantly changing the dialogue with our viewers and kind of asking them, what do you want to see? You know, what's something that you want to engage with us on a Friday night as opposed to watching something on Netflix or going out? <laughs> and really, um, our best season is the winter time because it's so cold. People want to curl up under their <laughs> covers. They want to watch 2020. And they want something that stays with them. You know, we are in this very sweet spot where we're not daily news because we're Friday nights. We're on every week. But we're not news. We don't talk about international news. We don't talk about ISIS. We kind of talk about stories a little more sensational. I like to call it sexy journalism. Uh, we do murder for hire. We do a lot of undercover stuff. We do a lot of um, behind the scenes. And it's a really great way for you to see the process of storytelling and how to look at long form in a different way. It's not documentary, so you're not going to sit there for 25 minutes. But I think you can dedicate maybe seven minutes, you know, and kind of sit down, get cozy, and um, kind of put yourself in the broadcast in a weird way. So what's in, in the... In the process of producing the show, where is the where's where, where's the rub come in? Like we want to do this this week. Oh, we we can't do that. That isn't part of our platform. That isn't that isn't you know our brand. So where are those struggles right now for for you guys, especially at 2020 and ABC? Well, we have to look at our timeline. Um, is it realistic? Um, we have to look at our budget. And we kind of have to look at the demographics. Are people going to actually watch, whether it's on their DVR or live? And we kind of have to look at, has it been done before? And if it has, has it done well for us? If it's done well, we'll do it again. But we'll do it a little bit different. You know, Maybe we'll try something different. Maybe we'll interact with you after the show online. We've started doing that more and more, where we'll bring the expert that we featured on the show, and we'll have them sit with us, and we'll do a chat with them, or we'll do a, a Facebook live feed. And they'll answer questions from the viewers. Um, what's really been helpful, too, is having more of our correspondents and our anchors kind of engaged through Twitter. And so we'll be live tweeting, and they'll answer people's questions as the show is going. And you kind of feel like you're a part of that dialogue. And you don't feel like you're just watching TV, but you're actually being a part of that experience. Um, but I think the struggle, too, though, just to touch on your question, would probably be to um, think outside the box. You know, 2020 has sustained itself as kind of like this seasoned broadcast because it's done so well they go with what works you know ABC tends to go with what works and if you try something a little too new a little too fresh I think they're maybe a little scared but uh, no risk no reward right so I think they they want to take more of those risks because I know you guys want to get in on this and you've got a lot of questions um, I'm gonna tell you very quickly about myself and I'm gonna get a fun fact from everybody here and then we're gonna open it up to questions so I'm also a grad of the uh, journalism school I came out uh, with a focus on documentary but I'm, I'm one of those multi-platform uh, uh, 
journalists. I covered uh, the space program uh, from NASA, from Cape Canaveral. I was a producer at uh, ABC's flagship station in San Francisco, where I produced the afternoon news, and I was lucky enough to work with a great team. Um, so I have a couple of Associated Press Mark Twain Awards and Edward R. Murrow Awards. And um, I've also done a lot of documentary work. So my storytelling kind of life has, has really run the gamut in, in all these different platforms. And a uh, fun fact about me, um, actually, let's start with Christina. Fun fact about you, we'll run down the line and then we'll open it up to questions. Go. Fun fact about me is I brought my mom to South by Southwest and she's <laughs> sitting right there. <laughs> Yay! Mom. Come on, Mom. All right, Nicole. Well, since we're at a Cal event, I actually got the Young Bear Award from Woo! the Alumni <laughs> Association in 2003, so very exciting. Thank you, bear. Young Bear. I'm not as young as I used to be, though. <laughs> well, I almost threw up on a presidential candidate in a helicopter once, so that's probably... Paul, it was Paul Simon who, not the singer, the... the yeah, he's a yeah. very, very nice former senator from Illinois, despite the fact that Hunter Thompson once described him as having the lips of Mick Jagger and the ears of a small baboon. He was a really <laughs> lovely person, really lovely. But you didn't quite fit. No, right? we, we were, it was the New Hampshire primaries and I was doing a profile of him and we were flying over, it was fabulous, like autumn and oh. beautiful. And Something you ate. <laughs> it was, I think it was really warm, you know, I'd never, I don't know that I'd ever been in a helicopter before, really noisy and the sun comes in and it, it just was, it yeah. was, it was bad. I, I got through it, but it was really close. <laughs> Great. So uh, a fun fact is this is actually my ninth consecutive South by Southwest. And the first time I was here was with actually my film uh, co-directed with uh, Jeff Plunkett from the Graduate School of Journalism called Playing the News, which was in 2005. And um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yes, yes. Clap. Yes. yeah, clap. thank you. Yeah, fantastic film if I say so myself. Yeah. Um, and this is actually my fourth Cal at South by Southwest and I have to say, it's, there's something really powerful um, about seeing a community outside of Berkeley, but understanding the value in the, in the power of this network. And, and a shout out to, to Duke and, and, and Brooke for really being uh, the forces behind making this actually happen. And, um, you know, and I have to say, uh, you know, part of, part of being on a panel, the great thing about a panel is like I get a little soapbox. So I'm using my soapbox for two Go seconds for Keep going. to give a great shout out to a fantastic director also from the Graduate School of Journalism, Tim Wheeler, who's Where here in the front you, row. Come on. He's got, um, he is here with his second film that's premiering at South by Southwest on Monday at 1.30. It's a fantastic film. I haven't seen it yet, but I know it's gonna be fantastic. I will be there in the, in the front, in the second row. <laughs> you don't wanna be in the front row. Um, at the state side. So I think there's a real value in this community here, and we're really excited about being here and continuing this connection between film, music, and art. And it's called Poached. And it's called Poached, thank <laughs> you. You can just search Tim Wheeler, it would be yeah. great. All right, uh, let's see, I went through, let's see, external affairs director now at the J School, and but before coming over to journalism, I was a career fire captain, so that's my fun fact. Oh. So, questions? Let's start, okay, right there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, great question. I mean, we actually at AJ Plus, we actually just started a satire unit. We have a unit that's actually dedicated to fantastic journalists. Um, we call, he, call, he calls himself an investigative humorist, Dan Illick, who has joined us and actually is producing and leading a team, producing content in that, in that realm. And we actually, and it's, it's tough because we looked at some of our pieces and we go, does the audience know that this is a piece of satire? <laughs> Do they actually, we actually did a piece about it, we called it, it was a Greek Kickstarter. And it was basically like a Kickstarter promo video, but it was really, and the reason we did it was, we, it really actually was a great, fantastic way to talk about the situation that's actually happening right now in, in Greece and on all of Europe. Um, but you know, what we did was, we actually now start labeling it, saying this is actually satire. 
we actually put a slate in the front that says this is AJ plus satire because we want it. It's almost like a you know disclaimer. It's almost like a we want we want you to know that this is the realm that we're about to enter. But the value of satire in a news space is that it actually is a, is a fantastic way to actually lead people into the conversation space. Um, I would give one other example of that, which is that we actually broke a story that um, you may be familiar with about a law student at Berkeley who was a former Marine, and he had left behind his interpreter in Afghanistan. He was not able to get a visa to come to the United States because of some really obscure um, visa policies. And, um, and so this law student was heading up an effort to get the law changed. And so we did a, you know, a, a really good, respectable story on that. Um, John Oliver later did it for HBO and did an absolutely fantastic knock it out of the park job because he had all the tools of satire with him. And, uh, and I would say, you know, he's, uh, he's actually hiring investigative reporters now. I'm very impressed with the reporting on that show. But, um, you know, he, he actually, in demonstrating the bureaucracy, pulled out this giant book of all of the rules and regulations that, and all the paperwork that you would have to fill out to get the visa. And um, by using satire, he did a better job of telling that story. And so I think, I think we need to be more open to that. I think that there are, I mean, how many of us have said, sometimes you watch a nighttime satire show that really tells you more about what the news is than anything you read in a newspaper or see in a regular newscast. And so, I mean, I think we have to be careful about how we do that. And, uh, I mean, I can see some potential dangers, but I also think we need to, to be way more open to the possibility that you can tell truth with satire. And because satire is such a powerful force for political and social commentary, it's why satire is so well protected by the fair use rules of the in the Copyright Act. So, you know, it has for centuries been recognized as such an integral part of political and social discourse. So if you get trouble for doing satire, call the ACLU. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the age of digital has also uh, made us very aware that um, you know stories they live forever on the on the internet. And yes, you can pull them down, but I guarantee you somebody has made a screen grab of that story and will bring it back to you and show it to you if you try and bury it. So I think that's maybe part of the the question you're asking. Um, I wonder, Jigger. Yeah. So we actually. For example, one of the one of the, the the core elements of AJ Plus is actually doing like a lot of explainer-based journalism. Like, let us talk about uh, you know what is apartheid, for example, before we can actually talk about what's actually happening today in 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 South Africa, right? And so we actually start to think about what is the constellation, the story world of each of these individual stories, and finding different ways uh, to bring together that community, right? So. Uh, you might not know, know about the situation, but let's actually bring your level of understanding up about that situation, and that might be done by a two-minute piece. And then that way you can actually understand the larger piece or the documentary piece. Um, and finding different ways to actually get people into that story world, for example. And the other thing that we see, and you're right, is the, the, one of the things about the internet as it is today is these very long tales that exist, right? You, the people are coming to our pieces, we're seeing pieces that we published four months ago that are now having a life today. And that's because of you just don't know when they will hit into certain streams. Um, and so creating content with that in mind. And that's the big, that's the big, that's the big value of, of actually working in this space is actually having those constraints, actually thinking about that people are consuming our content, especially for us, 85% of our content is consumed on a mobile device. 
That's a real thing that you know that people are actually doing. So use that as you're producing content. And that will actually unlock uh, a whole new type of storytelling. Do you have people that nurture it and have Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, we have a whole team that's dedicated to, to that. And actually, not even a whole team, we're actually trying to change the culture in order that everyone understands that that is what we are doing. It's, you know, for a long time, newsrooms prided themselves, um, you know, on respecting the wall that was between the newsroom and, say, the, the advertising, the sales department. And as the, the newsroom model shifted, those walls became transparent. And now in the digital age, you know, we can tell, you know, I can say that I've given, um, you know, my, I've given my reporter these particular stories in the last uh, month, and five of her stories have tanked. Two of them have done really well. So let's go and see what's wrong with this, this reporter's either reporting or is it the particular stories that the assignment editor is giving. So this, this idea that analytics have really changed what we do, as Jigger's mentioning, it's not necessarily just you know, three people hold up in one side of the room trying to figure this out. It's become common knowledge and nomenclature in a newsroom and in any kind of production. And we really haven't even touched on um, content producing for, for um, PR. Um, a lot of corporations, you know, their corporate uh, entities are coming to, for example, documentary uh, graduates and saying, we want storytellers. We want you to help produce this seven minute uh, video for our marketing department. And, you know, and then they are following those, as Jigger said, you know, they've got tails and, and they put a whole campaign together. So you, you're hitting on something that we just unfortunately don't even have time to, to get into. But that's really part of the interesting um, uh, part of this, you know, this digital age of storytelling. And I've, uh, Haley, my, I got to say, where is Haley? Haley, get, get over here, please, and get in front of this room. Haley really worked her butt off to put this together. No, come on up here. Come on up here. And for anybody who's ever been a producer, event producer, whatever, you know how much work goes in the back. So turn around, give everybody a wave. Thank you, Haley, for this. And she's been kind enough to tell me that we have just a couple of minutes left, right? Okay, so we have a couple minutes left. I know there were a couple more hands, but please, if, you, if we don't get to your question, you know, we're here. Feel free to Tweet ask. Us. We're also, I know we're all on Twitter, and we would love to hear from you. So one more question, somebody right here. I think you've hit on the one thing that remains the same. And if you, if we, we were to, you know, what do you guys think has remained the same? What has not changed in all of this uh, tech, you know, the technology has evolved and we've had to evolve and, and think about these things in different ways, but really what has not changed? I think this need and this uh, satiation, satiation for information and not just information in general, but just to get it out as fast as possible, to be accurate, to feed the minds of people who want to know more. The who, what, when, and why are always going to be there, but it's the way that people now access that information. They want it faster. They want it quicker. They want it in multiple ways. They want to be able to make sure that they can get it accessibly. And also, they want to make sure that it's accurate. Um, but I think that that drive for, for news, for facts, for information is, is always going to be relevant, no matter the, the format, no matter where you are, no matter where you live. It's, it's always going to be relevant. And I think having been at the ACLU for 10 years, I've had a great opportunity to work with a myriad of journalists and the, the value that they bring. I mean, we are often going up against incredibly powerful forces that want to keep what they're doing secret, whether they be the government or the most powerful companies in the world. And the role of journalism in getting out the truth and making sure that the public knows what's happening is just essential. And I think that the only change has been that we as an organization also now have to be storytellers about our own work as well. We just don't file lawsuits anymore and then wait for everyone to report about it. We also bring our stories to life through video and documentaries and blog posts. So we're working more in combination and collaboration with a lot of journalists than maybe historically happened in the past, but that work is symbiotic. Well, I was just going to say that I, I actually worry about what your very question. I mean, I, I hope that it, that hasn't changed. 
I think that I think there are places where it has changed, and I think that's a concern. Um, I think that if uh, if we get to a point where uh, where strictly popularity or these other metrics determine the kinds of stories we do and determine where funding goes, if what advertisers want to support, if there's more, a more direct line between this story pays off for an advertiser, therefore this is the story we want to do, there's some really important stories that advertisers may really technically not ever want to support. And then the question becomes how in a democracy, in a capitalist democracy, how do we get that kind of story reported? And I feel like if we, the line has blurred between sponsored content and reporting and all of that. There have been places where, where um, that blurring is pretty significant. And I, the only, the only um, thing that I cling to as sort of a hope about that is that there is the, there's a contract between readers and, and us. Um, and readers, I think, come to journalists expecting that we're not being influenced by all of those other things. And, I, I realize in the modern economy this sounds idealistic, but I, I, I actually believe that's a value that we really have to fight for and cling to. Because I think it's the concept of the public square, right? That you don't actually have to physically go to the public square now. You you can actually go to it digitally, and that's that's actually one thing that's actually very enlightening and actually very powerful when you actually think about it in those terms and why the concept of the public square was even uh, created to begin with. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.